India's principal economic advisor, Sanjeev Sanyal. And thank, thank you very much, Sanjeev, for being with us. Uh, politically, of course, uh, there will be many who will say this was an election budget. Uh, but you are an economist. And will you disagree with the fact that elections were in mind while this budget was being made? Well, the government of the day um, made a budget. Uh, I am not in a position to uh, judge or comment on whatever intention they may have had. I am quite happy to, you know, the elected government of the time made a budget that, uh, you know, they thought was right. So I, I am not in a position to make comments on why they did so. No fair point indeed. I'm not asking comments on that either. But I will quickly not waste time and go headlong into what has been done for the farming community. Uh, there are two questions there. Is it too little and is it too late is one question uh, because many people believe 6,000 rupees a year is that going to be enough to alleviate the stress on India's farms? I think we need to see it in context. This is not an attempt to solve every problem of every uh, rural household uh, that has, uh, you know, the idea is a very simple thing. We have had in the last couple of years, the farm sector has actually done very well in terms of real output. The problem is that they have faced, as a result, in fact, of the success of uh, producing more food, a deflation in their prices. And in some ways, this is actually a subsidy uh, to the rest of the economy because by making food available much cheaper for the rest of us, uh, the farming community has had to suffer a certain amount of stress. Um, so what we are essentially trying to do is to top up their incomes um, by 6,000 rupees a year. Uh, this, as I said, does not resolve every problem in rural India, but it does provide an injection of a significant amount of resources and spreads it around uh, out as well in the hope that some of there will be some multiplier effects as well. So this is a top up um, to a sector that has in some ways subsidized the rest of us. No, fair point indeed. Very quickly, Sanjeev, I, I know you're hard-pressed for time, but a quick question also on the middle-class SOPs that have been given. Uh, there are people out there uh, who are of the view uh, that some of the SOPs that are coming uh, are really going to be inflationary in nature. This is going to stoke consumption and not really investment. Well, I mean, as things stand, we have had now for several years uh, very, very uh, well-behaved inflation. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the last count, we were at the bottom of the uh, MPC's band at a little over 2%. Uh, in fact, the only time we have breached that band in the last several years has been to the bottom, never to the top. So I don't think there's any serious uh, uh, risk of uh, stoking spiraling inflation. Uh, especially given the context that in fact global growth and consequently uh, global uh, commodities and other prices also seem to likely to remain quite tempered. So in that environment, um, you know, uh, it, there's, there's highly, highly unlikely that we are triggering some sort of a spiraling inflation situation. Uh, if that situation arises, then we will also respond to it. There will be many other things will also change. So supposing inflation suddenly does go up, that means nominal GDP will grow up, that means the tax revenues will grow faster than has been budgeted and so on. So, you know, every situation has its pros and cons. You can't take, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the downsides of one, add it to the downsides of the other. Um, if inflation and growth is picking up, then to that extent, we will not need to provide support or exemptions or whatever it is that we are doing. So, um, yeah, so if growth picks up, yeah, we'll have different problems, but uh, uh, then we will also have different solutions. Okay, as an economist, I can't not ask you a question on budget math, and I'll let you go after that. Uh, the question, of course, is actually emanating from what Moody's has observed. And Moody's has quite categorically said that there is no serious attempt being made to address fiscal concerns of the Indian economy, and no new revenue streams are being identified either. This at a time uh, when questions are being, as it is raised, on the fiscal glide path. Yes, you may have done 3.4% this year, but we are nowhere close to the 3% figure that we needed to get to in 2008. So the fiscal glide path seems to be alluded not by this government but previous governments as well. Having said that, fiscal concerns continue to plague the Indian economy. Uh, 
I think we are, uh, the, first of all, the f we have not gone completely off kilter from that glide path. Uh, the fact that we are debating 3.3 and 3.4 uh, type, uh, percent of GDP type of uh, deviations, uh, you know, uh, tells you that we have come a long way from the days when we used to debate 4, 5, 6 percent of GDP. Secondly, uh, l please look at the primary deficit. That is the real deficit that is being coming from rev the current revenues and expenditures. And you will see that it is only 0.2 percent of GDP. In fact, it's slightly better, if anything, than what had been uh, done in the, in the uh, original budget estimate. Uh, so really, what we have is interest costs of past debts that has accumulated over time. And very frankly, in that space, there may in fact be, a, there may be in the medium term, good news because, because we have anchored inflation so low for so long, we are in a position to structurally lower interest rates in the medium term, which will feed through to our interest costs on debt. So as far as primary deficit is concerned, we continue to be very well behaved and, you know, once interest burden on, uh, on past debts begins to roll over at lower rates, that too will ease off. Okay, on that note, thank you very much, Sanjeev Sanyal, for speaking to us right here on ET Now and sparing time this evening. We are, of course, being joined by two uh, key architects of the union budget. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Kumar joins us. He's the secretary in the Department of Financial Services. And, of course, Mr. Ajay Bhushan Pandey joins us, uh, secretary revenue in the government of India. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with us. Uh, uh, we had a quick chat when the budget was done. And I think uh, now that Moody's has come out with a statement, I think it's only fair that I point that out to you and then hand it over to Maitri to take this forward. Uh, while expenditure uh, is a concern on the fiscal front, uh, Moody's has very keenly observed that no new revenue stream has been recognized. And for fiscal year 20, the revenue that you are estimating is very, very optimistic. 90,000 crore rupees from disinvestment proceeds, 82,900 crore rupees from RBI dividend plus PSBs. Uh, is that, isn't that overly optimistic for an economy that's just about beginning to look up uh, right now? You see, the, in our uh, current year uh, revised estimates, uh, oh. we have provided certain revenue figure and also for the next year, we have also, we have given the revenue uh, estimates. Now, if you see the direct tax, for example, now the direct tax, what is the kind of, what is our track record? For during the last three years, our track record has been that the, uh, in the current year, we are, we are about to achieve around 20% growth. Oh. The previous year, we had achieved already 18%. Uh, previous to that, we were we had achieved around 15% growth rate. Uh, you know, last year we added one crore new taxpayers in the direct tax. This year also we'll be adding more than that. So all these. So when we are talking about the new revenue stream, what we are saying is about the increasing the tax base. Now the tax base on the GST side again. If you see the, after the introduction of GST, our tax base has increased by 85%. Mm. Now, even this uh, revenue, uh, you know, even after reducing the um, uh, GST rates on many items during the last one and a half years, which amounts to almost giving, uh, you know, the uh, the total in terms of money, uh, you know, the, the tax amount, almost amounts to giving relief of 90,000 crores during the last one and a half years. Our tax revenue, GST revenue, which in the first year, it was around 89,000 crore per month. It increased to 95,000 crores. Now, this year, you know, in this month, we have crossed one one lakh crores. In fact, we have already we already crossed two lakh uh, one lakh crore twice in this current year, and we hope that GST is entering into a stabilisation phase. Mm. So what is happening is that you know the newest revenue streams, of course, you know at the time of regular budget, you know one could uh, you know one could consider various options, but so far as even the existing tax, if you can increase the base, number one, and secondly, if you can. Uh, you know, our, you know, what we are trying to achieve is moderate taxation and high compliance. Now, how do you have this high compliance? Now, there are various things which are being done in terms of, you know, indirect tax mm. because of this all, uh, you know, the formalization of the system, both either through the GST as well as through the income tax. Mm. You know, the people are, you know, filing returns. They are coming more and more and more. But into if the I may ask system. you a question, sir, on the GST revenue estimate has been kept at only seven lakh crore rupees after a very ambitious target that was kept this year. What is the reason there? Are, are you not expecting buoyancy? Are you being more realistic? 
No, no, no. Uh, when we are talking about the GST, this is the central side. You know, I mean, okay. the, if, uh, the, yeah, okay. you know, the central side, mm, right? Yeah. So, so from that point of view, if you see that those numbers are matched. Fair point. If you look at the CGI numbers, I think I asked you the question earlier also that only about 49% of revenue receipts have been received till November. I mean, look at the breakup. Corporation tax has been very, very poor, the mobilization. Direct income tax, personal grant has been reasonably good. Corporate income tax and again excise has fallen much way below what we anticipated as per the normal budgetary estimates. So what is the reason for both these, number one, and excise tax being cut on petrol at the time when petrol prices rose very high? Given that the fact that we are falling so short on revenue, why is the government not reversing that decision? No, no. If you see about this income tax, for example, yes. now the personal income tax, you know, if you see the trends during the past few years, it is always backloaded. You know, the people try to pay their taxes towards the, the end of the financing years, right? Corporation yes. Even even about this corporation tax, you know, also if you see, you know, we will have the taxes, you know, the 15th of March will be the time sure. when we'll mm, get the lots mm. of advanced taxes. So we have, you know, t uh, you know, carried out our detail, you know, the internal examination and we feel that we will be able to achieve that number and we will be able to achieve the growth. Uh, close to around 20% which we have provided in the budget. Now the next year we have provided the growth of 15%. Mm -hmm. 15% and that also we should be able to achieve that. Now so far as the disinvestment target, our minister has already uh, you know, explained this. Mm. And that also we should be able to achieve, GST I, I have already explained. So it, these all... But that the is the problem. The problem is that you are achieving disinvestment come what may through all kinds of deals and not really real stakes. And I'll come and hold you responsible for that in just a bit. Mr. Kumar, uh, there's some amount of confusion. Uh, if you can clarify this for us. Is there money that has been allocated for PSU Bank recapitalization next financial year? Because there they were flashes that we saw on the bottom of the screen that it wasn't. There's no mention in the budget. No mention in the budget. So why, why should I need that capital next year? That's the question. If you look at the entire PSB space today, mm. the recognition is almost over. Mm. And PSA have started coming down. The stressed assets are just 0.6% left now to the tune of around 36,000 crores. So there is no pressure which is going to come which requires provisioning. The PCR is already at 68%. Then recovery is at its all-time high. I have already recovered close to a lakh crores. And very soon because of the various pronouncements I am expecting, I have fixed a target after analysis internally of 1,80,000 crores in the current year which is a huge, huge target. Yeah. So and the capital essentially is the function of the banks to raise it themselves. It's not that one would keep giving them. So who would need capital? You for regulation or for growth? Mm. For regulation, the, you know that three PCA banks have come out yesterday mm. Mm. and now these are the ones who have shown better performance among the PCA banks. It's not that indiscriminately you want to give capital and bring everybody out. Sure. So the ones which will show performance, I have sufficient budget in the current year to take care of that. Mm. The, if I look at the entire uh, assessment of how much they are going to recover, how much they are going to have uh, the market raising, which the permissions have already been given, how much is in pipeline for the non-core, and how much is one can obtain through the synergies and scale, I think the present capital is sufficient to take care of the existing PCAs when as and when they improve to allow them to come out by supporting the capital infusion and also the non-PCAs to sort of take care of so their own needs. So I understand you correctly, government has not made any provision for providing capital support next year. We have, uh, we have made a token, we have How that thing is, is allowed, no that's just a token. So, how much uh, could you specify? Uh, that's not significant. That's just token. Mm -hmm. So that's head is so alive. I don't believe you will head have to resort to recapitalization. Absolutely. But you know, while we are at it, and while we're at the, I know we need to do the budget discussion here. But very quickly, eleven uh, banks were under the PCA. Three have exited. Uh, Two also. The uh, IDBI is uh, How with many the LIC. How do you expect to exit? So, so if you look at all the eleven, mm -hmm. IDBI is already with the LIC, and mm -hmm. you will soon see the turnaround plan from them. They have mm -hmm. detailed exercises mm -hmm. as to how they achieve synergies between two. Dena is going to the amalgamated entity, mm -hmm. and the results, as as we calculate, the amalgamated entity would also be crossing all the required regulatory parameters including mm. DENA, mm. but still we will support them if it is required for the growth or for DENA banks thing. So it leaves us with 3 minus 2, it leaves us with only 6. Mm. Of these 6, B 
based on their performance, which yeah. I am assessing based on their December results and the one which is going to come by March, yeah. there would be sufficient funds which we have to support them if they continue to perform. So two questions before I hand it over back to Maitri. Uh, what sort of lending uptick do you believe this is going to result in, the fact that so many of these banks are coming out of PCA? And I think the second and a more important question is, will there be more merger candidates in the pipeline? If you look at the growth potential, mm. the growth is already, for MSME it's already 10 plus, for otherwise overall also is already 15 plus the credit growth. So they are not constrained for growth as of now. The regulatory restrictions being removed from the PCA also enables them to grow. Uh, the, so I expect some of them to come out of PCA soon. Mm -hmm. And about amalgamation, there is always a scope for synergy and a scale, but it's a question of timing. Let's learn from the experiment of these three, which has happened in a record time of three to four months, mm. and it has gone so smooth. And there is a whole lot of enthusiasm when I talk to all three looking for the kind of uh, positive synergies it's going to bring in the entire operations, treasuries, mm. the employees. Uh, it's, it's looking very positive for the amalgamated entity already. Okay, okay. Well, as far as the government's fiscal deficit is concerned, look at the gross borrowing. It's substantially higher, 2 lakh crores higher. And that is bound to push up interest rates. That's an implication both on bank balance sheets as well as corporate investment. So how are you viewing this? Will the gov country really be able to absorb an additional borrowing of 2 lakh crores? The borrowing, as uh, my friend mentioned, you have the numbers see, in terms of the revenue projections. Also, you have the matching numbers in terms of the disinvestments and the other non-tax revenue all put together. So, if you look at the overall growth, which is the, because the foundation is lit, so now, looking at that growth, I suppose uh, this is within the 3.4, which is projected for the next year. It is a very doable thing without pushing the interest rates in any manner. And are you thinking... Because they have further reduced for the current year, if you know the calendar <coughs> already. And is there any roadmap as far as governance of public sector banks is concerned? Yes. So, what is essentially left in that entire space, that's yeah. what is to be seen. Yeah. If I just can take a half a minute and can paint you the entire picture, which is how much has been done. If you look at the entire financial institutions space, and that's because of that, things are coming up up front rather than being under the carpet. You have looked at these shell companies. You have looked at it from all angles. You have looked at it at shell companies. You have had a accountability in terms of NFRA. You have uh, PSB's appointments, which are done on this done on a, on a till at, at arm's length and in one day you announce the results the same day. Then you have IBC, then you are revamping the DRTs, we have raised the limit to 20. Then I am going to, we are going to do the entire auctioning of properties through a combined portal so as to not have any gaming system inbuilt. You have Serpesi, you have Krillic which we have introduced, you have fraud registries, you have stand, uh, stressed management uh, verticals above 250 crores, you have 50 crores loans being looked at because of that SMAs have come down. You have uh, you have Fugitive Offenders Act. You have you have authorized the PSBs for lookout notices. So it's yeah. the it's it's all around that you have tried to introduce a system by which the lending in this country is clean from all angles and all stakeholders will understand this as early as possible. And signs are that it's outside IBC the recovery is mm. serious and there cannot be credit decisions now hopefully that should be aggressive. So now the challenge is in the governance that you do not go back to where you are. The second challenge is how do you look at the HR within the systems mm. and the third is how do you more professionalize the boards. So these are the three major challenges, technology, risks, all that has been taken care of. Hmm. So I feel now these are the three things on which we have to concentrate further. Okay. Can we wrap this? Thank you very much, sirs, for being with us and explaining the budget. We'll, of course, continue to do more chats and we hope to get you on the channel next week uh, to explain the fine print. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Sir. Thank you. Thank Back you. Back to you in the studio.